that, but but in the context of 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 the Supreme Court, I mean, I you know it's really hard to sort of look at that debate last night and and think that if people came away, you know, to the extent that they uh, the debates mean change anybody's mind, and that's also a sort of a hard thing to contemplate. It certainly wasn't based upon any type of issue set. It was really just like, um, I don't know. You know, you know what it reminded me of was you know that that scene in the movie, the classic like after school special where the uh, the sympathetic kid gets beat up by the bully, and the girl that that sympathetic kid you know has a crush on finally recognizes him and goes over and says, "Let me help you. I'm sorry." And that's the way they start their relationship. I think that's what happened. I think Joe Biden may have picked up a couple of votes in that in that, in that fashion because because Trump was just being just out of control. <laughs> and, and, I, I mean, if we're if we're gonna go to childhood uh, uh, pop culture, I'm reminded of this every Scooby Doo episode where the villain is finally unmasked, and he's like, "I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you crazy black people." Um, I mean, that's look. I, I don't remember one, that. One of, one of the yeah, that maybe it was just what I heard. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the. One of the things that I've been trying to, one of the ways I've been trying to explain the debate is that if, if, you, if you did that thing that they do with singers now sometimes where they drop out all the accompaniment and you just hear their raw voice so you can see how Adele sounds so beautiful with no uh, you know, auto-tune or anything like that. Um, if you dropped out all the accompaniment, what Donald Trump said clearly was he wants to put Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court so she can hand him the election to the extent that the Proud Boys aren't able to intimidate enough voters on their own. That, that, that was the through line through all the insults and interruptions um, and crazy talk. That was the through line. He started with the acknowledgement that the reason why he wants to put Barrett on the court before the election is so she can hand him the election. He said that clearly, and then he clearly said that he wants white supremacists to engage in voter intimidation. That's that's the narrative of this debate. He's telling us his plan. Yeah, and you know, he's done that in the past, right? I mean, he always seems to tell the subtext. Uh, and, you know, you can imagine his advisors or whoever it is, maybe it's Roger Stone, basically laying it out. Uh, you know, the proud, I mean, this has been my theory for a while is that the Proud Boys are going to go in, they're going to interfere with the voting and, uh, and the counting enough so that certain deadlines become uh, either pass or crunched in terms of like certification and getting electors. And then the things start to move to the courts. Uh, and that's, you know, sort of some version essentially what happened in 2000 which of course, Amy Coney Barrett just coincidentally also uh, was, I think, you know, sort of uh, uh, working on that case on some level, not not high up. But if she gets on the court, Amy Coney Barrett will be the third Supreme Court justice that kind of got their legal start or rose to legal fame through Bush v. Gore. John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett all worked for Bush on Bush v. Gore. People need to remember what the actual issue was in the Florida 2000 Bush v. Gore lawsuit. Florida was trying to conduct a recount of its votes and the Supreme Court stopped the count, stopped the recount in Florida saying that there was no way to do that constitutionally. So in a situation that we have now now in Florida- Specifically because they didn't want to, they did not want to create the sense that Bush was not president because that would be prejudicial against him. Exactly. So instead, so, so in 2000, we had stop the recount. I think in 2020, the lawsuit is going to be stop the count, right? We know there are going to be a lot of mail-in ballots. We know they're not all going to be counted on election day night. At that point, Trump and his lawyers will sue for an injunction to make certain states stop counting their mail-in ballots. That will percolate up through the system. And what he's doing is, is positioning Roberts and Kavanaugh and Barrett, who have all, again, already made this argument to align with Thomas and Gorsuch, who we know are, uh, Thomas and Alito, we know are like crazy, um, to force these states to stop counting ballots that have been submitted legally 
and officially uh, stop counting them before they are able to tell us the results of the election and their states. That is the plan. That, that is what they are trying to do. Trump is no longer trying to win the election. People need to understand that, right? Like if you look at that debate point, that, that was not the debate performance of a candidate who is down trying to appeal to the broadest swath of voters. That was the debate performance of a candidate who does not care that he is losing the election in terms of votes. It's a candidate. It was a debate performance of a candidate who was planning on stealing the election, and thus he does not have to care about losing it. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's sort of modeling the behavior that he wants his uh, followers to um, to engage in going forward, which is like everybody's against us. We're going to fight until we win, period. It doesn't matter what, you know, what that looks like or how we go about doing that. Um, all right. Well, that also, I think, aptly describes Mitch McConnell's behavior over the course of, I don't know, at least six, eight years, 12 years, maybe now. I mean, um, and it has culminated. I don't know from Mitch McConnell's perspective how you could say anything other than mission accomplished beyond my wildest dreams. Um, right. I mean, he, he probably, um, got Trump elected by holding that seat open. He ended up getting three seats. You know, maybe you could argue two because, uh, Kennedy may have held out for another couple of years, uh, and not retired. had it been a democratic president, but uh, two to three seats. He's got over 200 federal judges, lifetime appointments, uh, breaking records, essentially, in terms of uh, speed. Uh, let's talk about Amy Coney Barrett. Um, I don't know. You want to start with, is there anything the Democrats can do? Well, let's first talk about her, and then we'll talk about why and what Democrats can do to at least slow the roll. Yeah, so in terms of her actual record, her record is one of an extreme conservative. Um, um, we can we can debate whether or not it's okay to be extreme conservative, but make no mistake that her positions are outside of the mainstream, even of her own party. It's why so often she is in dissent um, when she is on the seventh curtain circuit. Her views on abortion are well documented. She has not had the opportunity to directly rule on an abortion related case, but she has said that Roe v. Wade, that abortion is always immoral. She has said falsely that Roe v. Wade creates a, quote, framework for abortion on demand that is patently untrue. Roe v. Wade creates a framework where the state can limit or restrict abortions after fetal liability. Um, she has said that uh, a good Catholic judge should recuse themselves on issues um, where the Catholic Church's teachings are in kind of direct co conflict with secular law. But she did that. She said that in the context um, of death penalty decisions. She has not said that in the context of abortion decisions, which is point and click hypocritical. Right. So, let's, so let's stay on this for a moment because this is sort of fascinating. She wrote this in a uh, law review article. So, I mean, so to be fair, you know, we're talking about it was, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, maybe. Um, she has been a professor at Notre Dame University or prior to being on the Seventh Circuit, I incidentally, on a seat that was blocked. Already by, stolen, right? By the, by, you know, like another example, more or less like the Merrick Garland the story. It's just that it doesn't get much attention because it's a federal, um, you know, uh, a seat. And I mean, excuse me, a, a, it's, a, it's a judicial court as opposed yeah. to the justice, right? And, um, and so she wrote in this law review article, and now it's possible that, you know, she, she's evolved in her thinking of this, although I don't know that she's on record in talking about uh, evolving her thinking on this. But the, the argument she was making is, that if you are, if you believe in the canon of Catholicism in the way that she does, um, then it is um, incumbent upon you to recuse yourself from cases that uh, conflict with this. Now, I don't know, like, look, from my perspective, one's relationship with your religion is your own business. And if you feel that your relationship with anything causes you to recuse yourself, then you should. But she's out there making a almost like a an ethical or a moral or an ideological or a legal argument uh, that 
there's no reason to think that it would just apply to the death penalty as opposed to abortion. Um, it just so happens that maybe ideologically the those Catholics are on the wrong side of the death penalty uh, for her tastes. But um, I, that to me, like, in, in Diane Feinstein tried to talk about this in her Seventh uh, uh, Circuit, at the, and, it, and it blew up in her face yeah, because Diane really. Feinstein does not have the ability to sort of articulate this. Yeah, look, Sam, this is this is an interesting point to me because. I can live at that speed. I can accept a judge who says, you know what, I have a moral feeling about this issue or about this law. Um, my moral feeling is in conflict with an impartial application of secular law. And so I am going to step back. I am going to not be a judge in this case. I actually think the system would be better if judges recused themselves more often like, like and this doesn't have to be religion, right? I mean, it right, could be, you, I, I don't believe in the death penalty. I'm a judge, though. The law says the death penalty exists. But I got to say, I don't believe that we should be doing this. I'm against the law, so I need to recuse myself because I cannot be impartial in adjudicating this, whether it's because of my religion or just because, you know, I'm, I'm a good person in my mind or something. One, one of the reasons why we have multiple judges on appellate courts is not so we can be locked in this endless right-left liberal conservative battle. It is because there are situations where a good, decent judge understands that they cannot rule impartially on every freaking issue under the sun. And so I think we would, we would live in a better world if more judges, quite frankly, followed Amy Coney Barrett's argument in that particular law review article. My problem with Amy, Amy Coney Barrett is that that argument that she made in her law review article, she applies hypocritically. So right. if you're going to say that you should recuse yourself from a death penalty case, if you're basically going to say that you morally do not think the state should be involved in killing somebody, but you will not stand in front of the state to stop them from killing somebody, then by the same moral uh, uh, teachings, you should recuse yourself on a woman's right to choose, which is clearly allowed under secular law, 50 years of Supreme Court precedent says so, her moral beliefs on abortion should not matter. And if and since she has already put herself on the record that they do matter to her, she should recuse herself from issues of women's choice and women's rights. Of course, she won't. She won't. Hence, the hypocrisy, right? right. Um, she should recuse herself on Eighth Amendment cases, right? But she won't. Instead, she, she rules for a robust um, version of cruel and unusual punishment, right? She does, she does not protect people from cruel and unusual punishment. She thinks that cruel and unusual punishment is basically okay, according to her record. So it, it is, the, is, the, is the aspect of Amy Coney Barrett's judicial philosophy that is hypocritical with her faith that I find issues, not the application of her faith in or, or, or her, her seeming willingness to take her faith out of the mix on one specific issue, right? That's fine, but she should do it for all the rest. And it's not just that it's hypocritical relative to her, her faith. It's hypocritical in that she has created a, a an ethical or even you could argue legal principle uh, because it has to do with the recusal from a, 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 for a judge. And she applies that completely inconsistently. Exactly. Like, like it's like, it's not, you know, I, I, I'm perfectly okay with the idea that like, well, I'm not as attached to the concept of, of uh, you know, the, of the death penalty as I am um, abortion. Uh, and, and that's the way I practice my faith, yada, 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 whatever it is. But she's, she's the one who created this standard, which is if you, if you happen to be, you know, uh, uh, 100% bought into a, a certain canon, then you need to step aside. And she's not doing that. So what else, I mean, what else do we know about her um, as a judge, because I think the, uh, the, the right has been very explicit over the years about Amy, uh, uh, Coney Barrett and, uh, uh, Roe v. Wade. I mean, I could, I think I could have named, I don't know, well, maybe a couple more, but there's not many, um, you know, federal uh, judges I can name. Her name has been bandied about for even before she was in the judiciary as a, as the vote 
to uh, overturn Roe v. Wade because she was a woman and she is so reliable in that regard. But she's also an incredible right winger when it comes to a bunch of other stuff, too. Yeah, she she's an extremist. And this is, you know, I talking to non-lawyers sometimes I, 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 I struggle to make this point in a way that slaps. Right. That really sticks in their head. The kind of person who is willing to overturn Roe v. Wade. People kind of think that, oh, that's just a, a moral issue uh, um, or, you know, a legal like they just don't agree with one you know, particular Supreme Court ruling. Roe v. Wade is settled precedent. It's 50 years old. It has been upheld multiple times. It has been shaped and molded um, by, by other cases like Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Um, to be the kind of judge who thinks that they can just throw out that precedent, that's the kind of person who's willing to throw out a whole bunch of other stuff, right? Like you, like the, the, it's, it's a one-to-one -one connection. You, you can't have a person who's willing to ignore precedent on this issue and isn't willing to ignore precedent on, on a whole bunch of other issues um, that they just don't like. And so Amy Coney Barrett has a lot of issues that she just doesn't like, and she doesn't think precedent is that important. She has, in fact, written also about how she thinks that basically if the precedent disagrees with your moral compass, you should ignore the precedent, which is a crazy extremist theory for any federal judge to hold. Amy Coney Barrett has written that theory down. And so it comes, it comes, it comes at you in so many different ways. One of the one of the things that I, I, I try to make the point to people is are about is how she thinks about precedent when it comes to Chevron deference. Now, Chevron deference is yes. not a term. I'm actually just going to raise that, but let me, let me, let me, oh, I want to get to the Chevron uh, um, uh, deference because this is a huge issue um, that I don't think that people, you know, we've talked about on this program, but I don't think they, they fully appreciate, but just to, I, I want to just put a finer point on, on that part about, you, you know, you're expressing something that sometimes doesn't stick to people who don't have sort of a legal framework in which to view the the law you know we're seeing attacks on um on the the sort of uh the norms in the context of the senate but the fact of the matter is that those norms in and of themselves they change and this and that and that's sort of part of it and that's it's still a political process the one concept that supposedly anchors the law because it is the law at the end of the day, and it's supposed to work without having to bring out police officers, you know, be, on your opinion, because then you're just in brute force, is that the concept of stare decisis, the concept of if law is settled, to overturn that is the most radical, basic, like, earth shattering thing you should do and it should only be done with the greatest care and in the most extreme you know like just it has to be it's very hard to come up with a justification to do that when you're talking about a law that society has absorbed for 50 years and so her willingness to overdo to overthrow that simply because of a moral consciousness that she has when it's clear where the society is on this is completely nuts right it, it, that's the whole point it, it, it's it's such a critical point we have to remember these judges are unelected they are unaccountable to the popular will right the only reason why we allow them to wield that power that unelected unaccountable power is because we are supposed to be able to trust them to apply the law faithfully and applying the law faithfully means respecting precedent right so like if if we had if we you, you can talk about abortion you can talk about the right to privacy you can talk about birth control you can talk about a whole host of things but the but the the thing that a judge is supposed to do is to understand that if we have prior decisions if we have precedent on an issue the judge should not change precedent that's the legislature's responsibility to change precedent right that's the constitutional amendments responsibility to change precedent you can you should not change precedent unless it is as you were pointing out to an egregious kind of misapplication misuse of law that that society has long since moved beyond right so like when we finally get around to to to, to overruling plessy v ferguson and ending segregation right society had like that that is the level at which you're supposed to be willing to relook and re-examine 
established precedent. And Amy Coney Barrett is saying straight up, she should be able to overturn precedent whenever she feels like it. That's that, just, well, that's that's just not hear- a position that normal federal judges take. And, and that's why you'll hear um, folks like Amy Coney Barrett, and I don't know if she's done it specifically, but certainly this is a, a technique, to compare it to Dred Scott because they want to put it within that pantheon of there have been, we traditionally, we, you know, for, for uh, whatever it was, 100, 200 years, treated a certain segment of our population, certain people as if they were not human <laughs> in the context of our society, they were commodities. Um, you, you, want, uh, you want to put it on that level and to, to try and overcome the 50 years of this, but the, the, the circumstances are just not there. I mean, it's conceivable, I guess, that in 100 years we would come to sort of like feel that like, um, uh, you know, um, uh, women are just vessels uh, for, uh, for uh, procreation because of the nature of, of what has happened in society. <laughs> I mean, God help us if that happens or anything help us but th- we're not that's not what's going on here in that instance and, and people need to understand the, the the fight against Roe v wade is not a fight against abortion it's a, it's a fight against the legal concept of a right to privacy um, um we we are when the precedent sh- that she's overturning is the precedent that women have a right to privacy so autonomy not, over their body so it's not just a question of abortion rights it goes right to birth control rights right like the the first time the right to privacy was recognized by the Supreme Court was not in Roe v. Wade. It was in Griswold v. Connecticut, which is about a woman trying to get birth control. It is, it is, it is something that, that I don't know that most people can kind of grasp, but the long-term conservative fight here is not against abortion. Abortion is the hill, is the flag that they want to wave, but what they're really going after in the long term is abortion, uh, sorry, is birth control. And that is what Amy Coney Barrett is here to do too. 